Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, I welcome you to the 14th lecture on our course ADR and Arbitration. In, in our last lecture, we discussed about uh, conduct of arbitral proceedings. We discussed from section 19 to section 27. And in this present session, I will talk about making of arbitral award. That means I'll be talking about sections 28 to 33. So we have good number of sections to discuss in this one hour. So let's quickly start with section 28. 28 is rules applicable to substance of dispute. Now, if you recall in the last class, I discussed about section 19, which talks about procedural autonomy, autonomy of parties to choose the procedural law. 28 is about autonomy of parties to choose substantive law. And substantive law means substantive law of contract. Section 28 subsection 1 says where the place of arbitration is situated in India. So we are talking about India seated arbitration. There are two clauses you can see. In 28.1 there are two clauses. Clause A relates to an arbitration between Indians in India. That is an arbitration other than international commercial arbitration. In such a case the arbitration shall be done according to the laws of India. So therefore, parties do not have freedom to deviate from Indian law if the parties are Indian parties and if the arbitration is done in India. So there is no freedom. You have to do it according to laws of India. Clause B gives freedom to parties in case of international commercial arbitration. Keep in mind, we are talking about India city arbitration. In case of international commercial arbitration, the parties have the freedom to decide their dispute according to the law which they themselves designate. So, substance of the dispute has to be decided according to the law which parties designate. It can be any law, law of any country. The second clause says that designation by the parties of law of some country will mean designation of substantive law of that country, not the uh, private international law rules conflict of law rules. So, in relation to pure domestic arbitration that is between Indians in India, there is no choice. Parties have to do it according to Indian law. In case of international commercial arbitration done in India, parties have the freedom to designate law of any country to be their law. When they are designating law of any country, the designation would mean designation of substantive law. And the third clause says that if parties do not designate any law, then it shall be done by the arbitral tribunal. If parties do not identify the law, then in that case it shall be designated by the arbitral tribunal. And the tribunal shall designate law keeping in view the surrounding circumstances, the circumstances surrounding the dispute. So this is the content of subsection 1. It talks about freedom of parties to designate substantive law of any country to be their law and in case they don't do it then arbitral tribunal will do it and this freedom is available only with respect to international commercial arbitration. Now if you see subsection 2, subsection 2 says the arbitral tribunal shall decide according to what is just and good only when parties authorize the tribunal to do so. So tribunal cannot on its own take a decision to decide according to what is just and good. It has to be authorized by the parties. Subsection 3 is an important provision. It, it, it was amended. Subsection 3 says, while deciding, while making the arbitral award, the arbitral tribunal shall in all cases, in all cases means all the cases which I mentioned between Indians, ICA, whether it is designated by the parties themselves, whether the law is designated by the tribunal, in all these cases, Arbitral tribunal shall take into account the terms of the contract between the parties. 
prior to amendment, section 28.3 provided that in all cases, arbitral tribunal shall be bound by the terms of the contract between the parties and trade usages. Now it says arbitral tribunal shall take into account terms of the contract between the parties and trade usages. This is a significant change. We'll talk about the implication of this change. As I said, section 19 is concerned with procedural law. Section 28 is concerned with substantive law. I said section 28, the opening words of section 28, 1, which says that where the place of arbitration is in India, means we are talking about India seated arbitrations. But I may tell you that this phrase is not required because in any case we have section 2, subsection 2 in our act, part 1 which says that this part shall apply where the place of arbitration is in India. When the whole part is going to apply where the place of arbitration is in India, that includes section 28 also. So use of the phrase appears to be superfluous. I said in all cases, the arbitral tribunal shall take into account the terms of the contract and trade usages. While deciding the matter, the arbitral tribunal will take into account the terms of the contract and trade usages. And I said that, this was amended in 2015. Prior to 2015, it provided that in all cases, the arbitral tribunal shall be bound by the terms of the contract. So prior to 2015, there was no possibility for the arbitral tribunal to deviate from the terms of the contract because these terms were binding on the, on the tribunal. But now there may be circumstances where the arbitral tribunal may deviate from the terms of the contract because the provision does not say that it is binding. It only says that the tribunal has to take into account, tribunal has to just take into account the terms of the contract and trade usages. There is a judgment of Supreme Court in relation to this matter called as Jai Prakash Associates Limited versus Tehri Hydro Development Corporation India Limited. Supreme Court in Jai Prakash Associates Limited versus Tehri Hydro Development Corporation India Limited has discussed the relevance of the amended section 28.3. This has to be discussed in the context of prohibition clauses which parties include in their contract. Suppose the contract says that the arbitral tribunal shall not award interest. There is a prohibition that arbitral tribunal shall not award interest along with the principal sum. And suppose arbitral tribunal awards interest in that case this would mean violation of one of the terms of the contract. Can we say that such an award is violative of the provision and therefore invalid? Today we cannot because the arbitral tribunal can say that we are not bound by the terms of the contract. We definitely took into account the term which you have mentioned in the contract. So all the prohibition clauses which you have in your contract will have little significance now. Considering the fact that now after the amendment of 2015 in section 28.3, the terms of the contract are not binding on the arbitral tribunal. This has been done to overrule the judgment of ONGC Limited versus Saw Pipes. We'll talk about this judgment maybe in the next lecture. In ONGC versus Saw Pipes 2003, there was a contract. The award was in violation of term of the contract. And Supreme Court declared that award to be invalid against legality. In order to reverse that decision, an amendment has been done in 28.3. Prohibition clauses, as I said, no longer prohibit absolutely. In an appropriate case, the arbitral tribunal might be perfectly justified in overlooking the terms of the contract because there is an amendment in 28.3. If the facts of the case, if the applicable law require or justify deviation from the terms of the contract, then arbitral tribunal can validly deviate from the terms of the contract. As I said, this has been done to overrule the effect of ONGC versus Saw Pipes 2003 Supreme Court. We will talk about this case later on. So that is the meaning of section 28, subsection 1, 2 and 3. There is one more issue related to section 28. And that is, if you recall, I said in 28, the first clause says that in case it is an arbitration between Indians, in India, there is no freedom to choose law. 
the tribunal shall decide the dispute the substance of the dispute according to the laws of india now can two indian parties in order to avoid laws of india choose a foreign location for their arbitration try and understand since two indians doing it in india do not have freedom can two indians in order to avoid indian law choose a place of arbitration in some other country this was the case in this was the matter in the 2017 judgment of delhi high court called as gmr energy limited versus dusan power systems india private limited and others delhi high court relied on the decision of supreme court in atlas export industries of 1999 where the supreme court had observed that there is no prohibition for two indian parties to opt for a foreign seat and avoid application of indian law because when these two indians go out of india part 1 shall not apply and the provision of 28 1 shall not apply the provision which says that if it is an arbitration between two indians there is no choice you have to do it according to indian law that condition will not apply if you choose a foreign seat and supreme court in atlas export industries says that there is no prohibition for two indian parties to opt for a foreign seat and therefore avoid in application of indian law court says the case falls in exception 1 to section 28 of indian contract act section 28 says any agreement in restraint of legal proceeding is void so according to 28 an arbitration agreement which is in restraint of legal proceeding normal court proceeding is void but then you have an exception which says that arbitrations are exception to the general rule mentioned in section 28 referring to exception number 1 of section 28 supreme court in atlas industries said that it is nowhere mentioned that parties have to do their arbitration in india only to get the benefit of this exception even if if they do it outside india they still fall within the exception and therefore there is no prohibition for two indian parties to opt for a foreign seat madhya pradesh high court in 2015 in the judgment called as sasan power limited versus north american coal corporation also held the same relying on atlas industries before the delhi high court it was contended that atlas industries judgment of 1999 should not be relied upon because it is based on the arbitration act of 1940 but delhi high court says that when arbitration act 1940 permitted you to do it outside india to do your arbitration choose a seat outside india the new law which is more pro international commercial arbitration should also do in fact it should encourage you to go and adopt a foreign seat more than what 1940 law did so on the basis of atlas industries delhi high court madhya pradesh high court both these high courts have clarified that there is no prohibition for two indian parties to opt for a foreign seat this is what you have in section 28 so 28 is freedom given to the parties to designate substantive law for themselves this freedom is given only to parties in an international commercial arbitration there are certain other aspects which i mentioned for example the importance of section 283 what shall be the fate of terms of the contract to what extent arbitral tribunal shall be bound by the terms of the contract and we also understood as to can two indian parties opt for a foreign seat for their arbitration this is the first part of our discussion the next provision is 29a this is again a new provision which came in 2015 amendment prior to 2015 amendment there was no provision which prescribed for upper time limit within which tribunal has to pass an award for the first time we got a provision section 29a which sets time limit for making an arbitral award subsection 1 says that this time limit of 12 months within which the arbitral tribunal has to pass an award this 12 months time limit is applicable only with respect to arbitrations other than international commercial arbitration so for international commercial arbitration there is no mandatory timeline fixed although the provision says that the tribunal shall make endeavor 
to ensure that the award in case of ICA is made in 12 months, but that is not a mandatory timeline. So 29A shall be applicable to an arbitration between Indians in India, which I call as pure domestic arbitration, which may be called as an arbitration done in India other than international commercial arbitration. Now, with respect to this, the time limit fixed is 12 months and 12 months is to be calculated from the date of completion of pleadings under section 23 subsection 4. We discussed it in previous lectures that parties have the freedom to decide as to within what timeline pleadings have to be filed, but then the upper time limit is fixed. The entire pleading has to be completed in six months. Once pleading is completed, then we start calculating 12 months within which the arbitral tribunal has to pass the award. This is a changed provision. It came in 2015. It, is, it was amended in 2019 also. Prior to 2019 amendment, the law provided that 12 months from the date that the tribunal enters upon the reference. The date on which tribunal enters upon the reference means the date when all the arbitrators get notice of appointment. From notice of, one, of appointment to making of award, we had 12 months. That was a very ambitious timeline because, because a lot of time is going to be consumed in pleadings itself. So therefore, law was amended in 2019 and now the calculation of 12 months has been changed. It won't be calculated from the date on which tribunal enters upon the reference. It will be calculated from the date when pleadings are completed under section 23, subsection 4. So prior to 2019 amendment, uh, there were two things which, has been, which have been dropped now. One, the provision was applicable to domestic arbitration as well as international commercial arbitration. Now it only applies to domestic arbitration, pure domestic arbitration between Indians in India. It does not apply to ICA. And the second change which has come is as regards calculation of 12 months, it won't be calculated from the date when tribunal enters upon the reference. It will be calculated from the date when the pleadings are completed. This is what we have in 29A subsection 1. Subsection 2 says that in case tribunal is successful in completing, in passing the award in six months, the arbitral tribunal shall be entitled to receive such amount of additional fee as the parties may agree. This is not going to happen that often because six months time is too short a time for a tribunal to pass an arbitral award. But yes, that is mentioned. In case tribunal passes an award in just six months, the tribunal may be entitled to get additional fees as parties may decide. Subsection 3 says that if tribunal fails to pass an award in 12 months, then parties may extend the duration by 6 months. So therefore, the maximum duration becomes 18 months if parties agree to extend the duration. So 12 months is the timeline fixed. If tribunal does it in 6 months, it's a very good effort. Some additional fee may be granted, may be given as the parties may decide. If tribunal fails to do it in 12 months, parties may agree to extend the duration to a maximum of 18 months. So therefore, maximum duration becomes 18 months. An extension of 6 months may be given by the parties. Now, subsection 4 says that if the award is not passed within 12 months or if extension has been given within 18 months, then the mandate of arbitrators shall terminate. This is a mandatory aspect, you can see. It says the mandate shall terminate. So if within 12 months the award is not passed, the mandate will terminate. If it is extended by 6 months, within 18 months, award is not passed. But if it is proved that the delay is attributable to something done by arbitral tribunal, then a reduction of fees of arbitrators may also be recommended. So 12 months, 6 months extension becomes 18 months, after which the mandate will terminate if no more extension is granted by the court. If court extends it, the mandate will continue. But if no more extension is granted, the mandate will terminate. And if the delay has happened because of something done by the arbitral tribunal on the part of arbitral tribunal, then reduction in fees can also be recommended by the arbitral tribunal. Now, 
वर्ड कोर्ट विच वी आर यूजिंग इन ट्वेंटी नाइन ए मीन्स कोर्ट एज डिफाइन इन सेक्शन टू ई टू ई डिफाइंस कोर्ट एज कोर्ट मीन्स एनी प्रिंसिपल सिविल कोर्ट हैविंग जूरिस्टिक्शन बिकॉज ट्वेंटी नाइन ए डज नॉट अप्लाई टू इंटरनेशनल कमर्शियल आर्बिट्रेशन सो देर फॉर ओनली दैट पार्ट ऑफ टू ई इज एप्लीकेबल हेयर विच टॉक्स अबाउट द डेफिनेशन ऑफ कोर्ट विद रिस्पेक्ट टू आर्बिट्रेशन अदर देन इंटरनेशनल कमर्शियल आर्बिट्रेशन now what what we can see from section 20 29 a subsection 4 subsection 5 that parties may request for extension beyond 18 months tribunal has not been allowed to request for extension subsection 5 the language of subsection 5 indicates that any of the parties may approach the court it does not allow the tribunal to approach the court for extension but in a given case it is possible that delay is happening because of circumstances beyond the control of the tribunal in those circumstances i think tribunal must also be allowed to approach the court with a request to grant an extension the 2019 amendment has introduced two provisos in subsection to ensure fairness subsection 5 says the extension of period in subsection 4 may be on the application of the parties the two provisos have been incorporated to ensure fairness the first proviso will say that in case the delay is attributable to arbitral tribunal a reduction in fees can be recommended by the court but then the other proviso also says that while reducing the fees hearing must be given to the arbitrators so what i am trying to say in 29a you have a timeline 12 months extendable by 6 months by the parties this is further extendable by court and if the court does not extend the duration any more it will lead to termination of mandate of arbitrators if the delay is caused by arbitral tribunal then in that case reduction in fees can also be recommended but before recommending reduction in fees hearing has to be given to the arbitrators i said the language indicates that only parties can approach the court for extension of duration tribunal has not been allowed to approach the court whereas i think that tribunal may also be allowed to approach the court with a request to extend the duration and not to terminate the mandate now once the mandate of arbitrators will terminate under subsection 4 if the mandate of arbitrators terminate then substitute has to be found and how will we find a substitute subsection 6 says that court will find the substitute in place of arbitrators whose mandate have terminated now this is slightly problematic because if you recall while discussing section 15 i have already mentioned that if an arbitrator is challenged and removed under 12 or 13 14 in any of these sections a substitute for that arbitrator is to be found according to section 15 the only provision in the act which talks about finding a substitute and 15 subsection 2 says a substitute has to be found by using the same rules which was used to appoint the original arbitrator here section 29 a subsection 6 does not say that this provision is exception to 15 2 and directly says that court is going to find a substitute imagine the original arbitrator was appointed by the supreme court or the high court under section 11 can a principal civil court of jurisdiction can find a substitute that appears to be slightly inconsistent with section 15 and therefore what we can do we may identify 29a subsection 6 as an exception to section 152 subsection 8 talks about imposition of cost any party under this section the court can impose cost including exemplary cost upon any of the party under this section and subsection 9 says that court under section 29a has to dispose of the matter as expeditiously as possible an endeavor shall be made to dispose of the matter within a period of 60 days from the date of service of notice on the opposite party so if a matter in section 29a subsection 5 comes to court the same must be disposed of in a matter of 60 days now i will leave this question for you does the provision mean decision has to be taken within 60 days including 
the decision regarding finding a substitute because that is also included in section 29A itself. So, does the decision or disposal also include decision as regards finding a substitute? That is a question for you. You may think on it. So, 29A talks about the timeline which is fixed for passing an award. Section 29B is also a new provision. It is about fast track procedure. It allows parties to an arbitration agreement to agree in writing to have their dispute resolved by way of fast track procedure at any point of time before or at the time of appointment of arbitrators. Parties in writing can agree that they want to resolve the dispute by way of fast track procedure. This is notwithstanding all other provisions of this act. This creates a space for the parties to deviate from their agreed upon procedure. So therefore, this has to be identified as an exception. That is what 29B does, notwithstanding anything contained in section 7 or 8, now the parties are willing to adopt fast track procedure and they have agreed for the same in writing at the time of appointment of arbitrators. When parties agree to resolve their dispute by way of fast track procedure, the first thing they may do is that they may agree that now it shall, the arbitral tribunal shall consist of sole arbitrator. This is notwithstanding whatever they must have written in their original arbitration agreement. They may have agreed for three arbitrators originally, but they are free to reduce the number to one in case they opt fast track procedure. And then it subsection 3 will tell you the procedure which the tribunal is going to follow in case of fast track mechanism. The fast track procedure shall be based on written pleadings only without any oral hearing. Oral hearing will be held only if all the parties make a request or if the arbitral tribunal considers it very necessary. Even during oral hearing, the arbitral tribunal may dispense with the technical requirements. So that is how the procedure may be conducted. Subsection 4 says that a fast track procedure must be completed within 6 months from the date arbitral tribunal enters upon the reference. Now, this is a point where a change is required. Initially, 29A also said that 12 months is the timeline for passing an award from the date when arbitral tribunal enters upon the reference. I mentioned that. A lot of time gets consumed in pleading. So, therefore, that was changed and now 12 months is calculated after completion of pleadings. But we forgot to make the same change here in 29B4. We are calculating 6 months from the date when arbitral tribunal enters upon the reference. Probably that becomes too ambitious for any tribunal to pass an award even if it is a fast track procedure, even if it is done on the basis of documents alone. So, therefore, we must make some change here and calculate 6 months from the date when pleadings are completed, even in case of section 29B. So, that is about the timeline 29A and 29B which talks about fast track procedure. The next important provision is section 30, settlement. If you recall in initial lectures, I introduced section 89 of CPC in which I said that parties get an opportunity in section 89 to opt out of litigation and go for other methods of settlement. If the court finds there exists element of settlement, court will encourage parties to go for other methods of settlement. ADR in suit, court induced ADR. On similar lines in section 30, arbitral tribunal is also obliged to encourage parties to go for more amicable methods of dispute resolution, for example, mediation, conciliation, and it shall not be incompatible with the arbitration agreement. There is an agreement, there has to be arbitration, section 8. And now we are talking about a situation where despite having an arbitration agreement, the tribunal is encouraging you to go for methods like conciliation and mediation. So, this essentially is violative of section 8 because 8 says if there is an agreement, there has to be arbitration. Therefore, we have used this language. It is not incompatible with an arbitration agreement. What we are trying to convey is section 30 is an exception to section 8. And even if we have an arbitration agreement, 
there is a possibility that you can do something other than arbitration. So therefore, section 30 subsection 1 says it is an exception to section 7 and 8 that arbitral tribunal encourage parties to go for more amicable methods of dispute resolution. It is the responsibility of the arbitral tribunal. And if during arbitral proceedings the party settle the dispute, the arbitral tribunal shall terminate the proceeding. And if parties request, then arbitral tribunal shall record the settlement in the form of an arbitral award. The arbitral award recorded under section 30, the arbitral award on agreed terms shall have the same status and effect as any other arbitral award. And it shall be made in accordance with section 31 which talks about form and content of an arbitral award. So section 30 is an opt-out provision. Section 30 does not require parties to inform the tribunal about any settlement which they must have done. But it is an implied requirement because otherwise how will the tribunal terminate the proceeding? Recording of settlement is important because, because settlement in itself is not enforceable under Arbitration Act. Once the settlement is recorded by the tribunal, it gets the status of an arbitral award on agreed terms and it has to be recorded according to the requirements of section 31. And as I said, the effect of such an arbitral award on agreed terms is not different from any other arbitral award. So we have understood 28, 29A, 29B, section 30, which is an opt-out provision. The next is section 31, which is about form and content of an arbitral award. Section 31 does not prescribe any form. It does not provide any form, but it, it, it says that the arbitral award must be in writing, must be signed. It is sufficient if majority of arbitrators sign it. The dissenting arbitrator may not sign it, but he has to explain the reason as to why is he not signing it. Date of signing is also important because date helps in calculating the time limits. Limitation Act applies to arbitration in the same manner as it applies to suits and litigation. So therefore, keeping in mind the importance of Limitation Act, date becomes important and therefore date of award must be mentioned. And if date is not mentioned, the date of last signing becomes the date of award. Whether the award must be signed by all the arbitrators at the same place, at the same point of time was, was an issue at some point of time. Initially, courts were inclined to get all the arbitrators signing at the same place, at the same point of time, because that would, that would mean meeting of minds. So law was in favor of contemporaneous signing. But then we got certain cases. One is 1982 judgment of European Grain and Shipping Limited versus Johnston. If the award court says if the award is unanimous award and if all the arbitrators have participated in passing that award, then there is no objection if arbitrators sign at different times and different places. So contemporaneous signing is no more relevant provided it is an unanimous award. Then in 1988, there is another case called as Bank Melat versus GAA Development Construction Company. Court says even if it is not a unanimous decision, still contemporaneous signing is not a mandatory rule. So that is about form of an arbitral award. There are few things which must definitely be there in an arbitral award. We are talking about the substantive requirements of an award. The award must contain decision of the tribunal on all the issues of fact and law. It must also contain the relief. The award must be certain. The award must be capable of performance. That means it must be clear, unambiguous, confined to the terms of reference, must not go beyond what is submitted to the tribunal. It must clearly identify what has to be done by whom. Because an award can be set aside under section 34, we will talk about it later on, an award can be set aside on the ground of vagueness, uncertainty. Therefore, the award must be consistent in all parts. It should be complete. It should not leave any issue unaddressed, undecided. Because again, incomplete awards are reviewable under section 34. 
the award must be final the award must be unconditional and the most important thing is there must be enforceability in the award vague awards uncertain awards are not enforceable there is one point which i want to highlight here section 31 subsection 7 talks about it we discussed what is the form there is no form prescribed it has to be in writing it, there must be signature of all the arbitrators date must be there contemporaneous signing is no more the rule we saw as to what are the contents the bottom line is that the award must be consistent in all parts it must not be a vague award it must not be an uncertain award it must be an award which is capable of performance which can be enforced otherwise vague awards are enforceable under section 34 section 31 sub section 7 talks about interest if the award is for payment of money if the award is for payment of money then tribunal may grant interest at a rate 2% more than prevailing rate of interest now i am not focusing there what i am trying to say there is a date which is date of cause of action and there is a date which is date of award so from cause of action to award interest shall be calculated and apart from principal sum interest shall also be awarded by the tribunal to the party winning the matter this is interest number 1 from cause of action to date of award if the if the dispute is of value rupees 100 then award shall include interest also on that amount of rupees 100 but the real problem is this is date of award and this is date of actual payment of money the person who is obliged to make the payment may delay the payment maybe 3 months 7 months 1 year so from cause of action date of award principal sum and interest is awarded but that is not paid so additional interest of some percentage will be imposed on the days for which you are delaying the actual payment this is interest number 2 the question which arose in various cases in fact law commission also made recommendation on this question was whether this second interest is to be calculated on the principal sum awarded by the tribunal or whether it should be calculated on sum of principal sum and interest number 1 awarded by the tribunal because in the second case if the second interest is calculated on principal sum as well as interest awarded by the tribunal that would mean interest on interest that would mean compound interest is compound interest payable is the question involved here is compound interest payable is the question under section 31 sub section 7 in renu sagar power company case supreme court said that compound interest is permissible it is not violative of public policy of india again in the case of state of haryana versus sl arora 2010 supreme court says that compound interest is not allowed in section 317 so divergence of opinion this was finally settled by a judgment called as haider consulting in which the court says that section 31 sub section 7 uses the word sum to refer the aggregate of amounts that may be directed to be paid and not merely the principal sum so while calculating second interest second interest has to be calculated on the sum and sum means principal sum and the interest awarded on the principal sum so therefore interest on interest is permissible this is what supreme court in hyder consulting the larger bench of supreme court in hyder consulting in 2015 says so that point is clarified section 31 sub section 7 allows for payment of compound interest the second interest can be calculated on the sum and not just on the principal sum so therefore what all we discussed in this lecture so far i i quickly rushed through the provisions i discussed section 28 
which talks about rules applicable to substance of the dispute. Keep in mind that the freedom is given only in case of international commercial arbitration to the parties to choose law of, of any country. This freedom is not given to parties in case arbitration is done between Indians. Then we said that this is, this is something which attracts parties towards arbitration. 19 is procedural freedom. 28 is freedom with respect to substantive law. We talked about section 28, subsection 3, which says that now onwards after 2015 amendment, arbitral tribunal is not bound by the terms of the contract. That's a very significant thing. Arbitral tribunal is not bound by the terms of the contract. It is only obliged to keep in mind the terms of the contract. So that is important. We refer to the case of Jai Prakash Associates and now we understand that the prohibition clauses in arbitration agreement, the prohibition clauses in the contract between the parties can be, can be ignored by the arbitral tribunal in certain cases where it is it can be justified. We also discussed that two Indian parties can validly opt for a foreign seat and that is how they, they can avoid application of Indian law. They may also get the freedom to decide the law of their choice by adopting a foreign seat. We referred to the case of Atlas Export Industries of 1999. Section 29A and 29B are new additions. In 29A, we discussed the timeline within which the award has to be made. It is 12 months from the date of completion of pleadings, extendable by six months. We said that this time can be extended by the court. If the court does not extend it, it will lead to termination of mandate of the tribunal. Whatever court does, including the fact that court, once the mandate of arbitrators terminate, the court has to find the substitute. And for all these, court has been given a timeline. The timeline is, is 60 days. If you recall, I said within 60 days, the court has to complete the proceedings. I said whether these 60 days are available to court only for the purpose of deciding the matter or does it also include the question of finding a substitute? This is for you to take, make an opinion. We discussed about fast track procedure. Fast track procedure, there is an amendment required in subsection 4. If you remember, I said that it has to be done within six months from the date when, when the tribunal enters upon the reference. This needs to be modified. We can have the same thing which we have in section 29A. That is, the time must be calculated from the date of completion of pleadings. Section 30 is an opt-out provision. Section 30 obliges the arbitrator to encourage parties to go for more amicable methods of dispute resolution like conciliation, mediation, etc. Parties are not expressly required in the provision to report their settlement to the tribunal, but the provision says that if the settlement is arrived at, the tribunal will terminate the proceeding and if parties request, tribunal may record the settlement. Such a settlement becomes an arbitral award on agreed terms. Arbitral ag award on agreed terms has the status of like any other award, it has to be passed according to section 31. Section 31 deals with form and content of arbitral award. I said there is no form prescribed, but it has to be in writing, signed by the arbitrators and there must be date mentioned clearly. If the date is not mentioned, date of signing by the last arbitrator becomes the date of the award. Contemporaneous signing was initially the rule, which is now diluted. I referred to some cases where courts have held that contemporaneous signing is not required. I also mentioned that there are certain requirements in an arbitral award. It must contain the decision of the tribunal, must contain the relief, must be certain, capable of performance, must be consistent in all parts. It must be complete award. It must be unconditional award. And there must be the element of enforceability. We refer to uh, one specific aspect of section 31, that is section 31, subsection 7 which talks about payment of interest and this is applicable if the award is for payment of money. I said that the second interest, if you recall, which is the interest for the period between date of award and date of actual payment, 
the second interest can be calculated on the sum including principal sum and first interest so therefore interest on interest is permissible compound interest is permissible now let's come to the last two provisions of this chapter one is termination of proceeding and the other will be section 33 we'll talk about section 33 also section 32 is about termination of arbitral proceeding but that is not the only provision where ter arbitral proceedings will terminate you can see there is a list of provisions under which arbitral proceedings terminate for example the first is termination of arbitral proceeding in case of default by the claimant i discussed it in the previous lecture that section 25 provides for three situations three kinds of defaults the first default is when the claim statement is not submitted and i said when the claim statement is not submitted there cannot be anything but termination of proceeding otherwise what will the tribunal decide so when the claim statement is not submitted that is a situation where the proceedings will terminate second i just discussed about section 30 and opt out provision where parties go out of arbitration and try to settle their matter by way of more amicable method of dispute resolution conciliation negotiation mediation etc they will report their settlement to the tribunal and tribunal will record the settlement and the proceedings will terminate so second situation where proceedings will terminate is section 30 that is settlement the third situation here is when the tribunal passes a final award and if you recall in the initial lectures also i said final award has two effects one is res judicata the other is the tribunal becomes functus officio defunct the proceedings will terminate the mandate of the tribunal will terminate so the third situation when the man the term proceedings will terminate is when a final award is passed this is there in section 32 subsection 1 in section 32 subsection 2 there is a possibility of termination of proceeding on tribunal order when will the tribunal order to terminate the proceeding there are certain instances mentioned the claimant withdraws his claim if the claimant withdraws his claim the tribunal will order that the proceedings be terminated second parties may agree that proceedings be terminated and therefore the tribunal will order for termination of proceeding and third if the tribunal is of the opinion that the proceedings are not going in any direction and it becomes unnecessary or impossible for the tribunal to go ahead with the proceeding then in that case also tribunal may order for termination of proceeding these are some of the situations which will lead to termination of arbitral proceedings in addition to it arbitral proceedings may be terminated in case parties fail to make advance payment to the tribunal and we just now discussed about section 29a in which i said the duration within which the tribunal has to pass an award is 12 months extendable by six months and the mandate of the tribunal terminates unless the court extends the duration further so there is a possibility of termination even in section 29a the last provision which i want to discuss here in this lecture is section 33 section 33 is a mechanism of revival of mandate of arbitral tribunal revival of mandate of arbitral tribunal because i just said that proceedings terminate in section 32 when the final award is passed proceedings terminate when the final award is passed once the final award is passed the proceedings terminate the tribunal becomes defunct for certain purposes the mandate of the tribunal has been revived in section 33 now this revival i'll go back to my previous lectures when i discussed about section 17 if you recall i said section 17 which talks about power of tribunal to pass interim measures was amended in 2015 after 2015 now section 17 could be invoked during the proceedings even after the award is passed but before it is enforced 
Section 17 could be invoked, a tribunal could be requested to pass interim measure during the proceeding even after the award is passed but before it is enforced. But then I said that this second part that is tribunal could be invoked even after the award is passed but before it is enforced. This second part was subsequently dropped in 2019 amendment. Why did we drop it in 2019 amendment? Because we understood that after the award is passed, the tribunal has become defunct. Tribunal does not exist anymore. And unless you have a provision which revives the mandate of tribunal for the purposes of passing interim measure in section 17, you cannot say that seven, under 17 the mandate will be revived. So you need to have a provision to revive the mandate once the final award is passed. Since that is not there, so therefore the second part was dropped in 2019 amendment. Realizing that now it is available only as long as the tribunal exists. But coming back to section 33, there are few situations with respect to which the mandate of the tribunal has been revived. These are correction of errors, second interpretation of award and third additional award. Correction of errors will include correction of computational errors. It will include correction of clerical error, typographical error or any other error of similar nature. But one has to keep in mind that an error which can be attributed to the exercise of judicial consideration or judicial discretion cannot be a clerical error or typographical error. So therefore, it is relevant to mention that error of substance cannot be corrected by, sec by, uh, by the tribunal under section 33. It is one provision just to correct minor errors, computational, clerical, etc. An error of substance cannot be corrected in the name of section 33. So therefore, what I am trying to say is, in the name of correcting errors, the tribunal cannot give second thought to the matter of the judgment. So the substantive parts cannot be corrected. That means a tribunal cannot reconsider its decision, cannot modify its decision, cannot review its decision in the name of corrections to be done under section 33. This is one, this is the first purpose for which the mandate of the tribunal revives. The second purpose is for the purpose of interpretation of the arbitral award. It is possible that the parties fail to understand the true scope of the arbitral award. In that case, the tribunal may be requested or tribunal on its own motion can interpret the award so that clarity emerges out of it. So therefore, the mandate revives again. The last reason for which the mandate revives is additional award. It is possible that out of 10 issues which were submitted to the tribunal, tribunal answered only 9 and forget to answer one of the issues. Therefore, in order to answer those leftover issues, the mandate revives and tribunal will pass an additional award. We discussed this term when we were discussing the meaning of the term award and kinds of award if you remember. So for these three purposes, mandate will revive. In addition to section 33, there is one more possibility of revival of mandate that is there in section 34, subsection 4. When an award is challenged before the court, it is for the court to see whether the grounds of challenge can be removed or not. If the court is of the opinion that the grounds of challenge can be removed if the matter is remitted back to the tribunal. I understand. If the court is of the opinion that grounds on which the, the, the award has been challenged, those grounds can be removed if the matter is remitted back to the tribunal. Then under section 34, subsection 4, the court will remit the matter back to the tribunal and the mandate of tribunal revives. So this is what you have in section 33 and section subsection 4 of section 34. So therefore, let me conclude. 
After this lecture, you must have learned the aspects of making of award, section 28, 29, timeline, section 30, settlement, 31, form and content of the award. We also discussed about termination of proceeding. The law of arbitration has been evolving. And therefore, in 2015, we introduced new sections like 29A, 29B. Certain aspects need to be clarified. The clarifications will emerge after working off the new provisions. We also discussed section 30, which is an opt-out provision inspired by section 89 of CPC. Section 30 says that parties will be encouraged to adopt more amicable methods of dispute resolution. We will discuss those amicable methods in last few lectures. That's all I have in this lecture on making of award. The next lecture shall be on recourse against arbitral award section 34. So I propose to divide section 34 into two sessions. We'll be talking about section 34 in next two lectures. Thank you for joining. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to this piece of literary snippet. Perhaps the most popular literary genre after novel is the short story. Sharp, compact narratives whose charm lies not only in what is said, but also in what remains unsaid. Today I'll be reading one of the shortest instances of a short story that I have ever encountered. And Indeed, the very charm of this particular story that I'm going to read out today lies in the way it abruptly ends. It is an ancient tale from Mesopotamia, which has been retold by several authors, among whom the name of Somerset Mom stands out. Uh, the adaptation that I'll be reading out is perhaps the closest to the one that Mom wrote. The story is titled, in all of its adaptations almost, as Appointment in Samara. Here is the story. A merchant in Baghdad once sent one of his servants to the market. The servant was supposed to buy provisions for the merchant, but when he returned, he came back empty-handed. Indeed, the servant had all gone white, and trembling with fear, he told his master that he had met death in the marketplace. When I entered the market, the servant said to his master, I was jostled by a woman, and when I turned to look at her, I saw that she was death. I am very scared, master, because death looked at me with a threatening gesture. Can you please lend me your horse so that I can fly away from Baghdad to the town of Samara and thereby escape death? The master, being a good man, gave his servant his best horse and saw him gallop off to Samara to escape death. Then the master himself went to the marketplace and confronted death. Why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant? Asked the master to death. And death replied, It was not a threatening gesture. Rather, it was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see your servant here today, because this evening, I have an appointment with him in Samara. See you 
in the next episode of Literary Snippet.